welcome to this Upgrade Your Sound product showcase. My name is Kurt Witt with Music and Arts. I'm really excited to spend some time talking about Yamaha Step Up Saxophones. We've got a couple of special, special guests joining us from Yamaha, uh, Austin Snowden and Chris Dolson. They're here to cover a couple of key models, share some unique insights about what makes Yamaha's saxophone special, and of course, answer any questions that might come up along during the presentation. You can see some Q&A functionality at the bottom of your screen. So at any point during the session, uh, feel free to post a question and somebody will be able to answer you either in the chat or, uh, or live. During the showcase, I've also got a couple of group polls that'll launch to get some feedback from the audience on some different subjects. Uh, and then we can hear some discussion from our expert panelists on those subjects. Yamaha saxophones are incredibly popular these days among all level of players from students to teachers uh, and teachers to professionals. We're gonna dive in depth on three particular models and hear from these experts why Yamaha is a great choice for the advancing saxophonist looking for a better instrument. So welcome Austin and Chris and take it away. Well, thanks Kurt, appreciate uh, the opportunity to be here with everyone tonight. Just wanna introduce myself. My name is Chris Dolson. I'm the regional manager for Yamaha. And joining me tonight is my colleague, Austin Snowden. Austin is our Windisman product specialist as well. He's, you know, a saxophone player, which makes it uh, particularly convenient for tonight's uh, presentation. He's gonna be doing the bulk of our presentation tonight, especially when we get into the instruments. But before we dive in, I just wanted to give you a, a real quick background on Yamaha. So Yamaha is the world's largest manufacturer of musical instruments. Um, you might recognize some Yamaha products like motorcycles and wave runners and off-road vehicles. Uh, those are all great, but our foundations are in music. You know, we were founded in 1887 as a music company. For the past 133 years, we've been making some of the best man, uh, best musical instruments uh, it found in any country on this planet. So music is, the, music is at the heart of what we do, and it's our core mission to create more music makers. So with that, I'd like to talk just for a second, you know, about our design philosophy. So you can see here, you know, there's kind of four pillars of our design philosophy, and one of them is chasing the sound. So we have a saying here called sound is Ichiban. And what that means is sound is number one. Uh, everything we do is uh, in terms of development is for the sound world, looking for a specific sound, not for a set of specifications. Uh, in order to bring an instrument to market. When you talk about Kaizen, it's really a, a Japanese term that means to continually refine a process. We're never satisfied. So even if, after we develop an instrument, we will continually tr try to refine that instrument to continue to make it better and better and better. Uh, vertical integration is one of those uh, things that's kind of unique to Yamaha. This is where we would design the top level instrument first. And I know Austin's gonna talk about this a little bit today, um, especially when he goes through the EX and how it relates to the rest of the line of saxophones. But vertical integration, we're designing that top level first and then working some of those features, whether they're specifications of the instrument, sound characteristics, or even manufacturing processes down through the lineup, all the way down to the intermediate and even student models. And you might be thinking, why is this important? But it's kind of different than how some other manufacturers do it. A lot of people take that student instrument, add a bunch of features to it, soup it up, so to speak, and get a pro model. Um, we're taking that pro model first and working those features down through the lineup. So you automatically start as a young child, as a young music maker with a higher quality level of instrument. And then it feels so comfortable in your hands and your ears as you work your way up through the line of instruments. And last but not least, Yamaha is really known for being super consistent. One of the cool things about it is, is that we can make one thing and we can make it a million times the same way, super consistent. So why that's important to you is that if you go into a store, music and arts location, or you order it online through Woodwind and Brasswind, you're gonna have a very consistent instrument. You don't need to try 10 of them to find the one for you. So with that, I'm going to kick it over to Austin and let him take you through the instruments. Great. Thanks, Chris. Um, 
Yeah, as, as you mentioned, my name is Austin Snowden, product specialist for the Winds and Strings team at Yamaha, a saxophone player myself. And I forgot to mention this earlier, Kurt, but I actually purchased my step up instrument from an upgrade your sound back in the day. Uh, so it's really neat to be involved with this now from, from this side of things. So um, yeah, we're going to start today uh, following the, the path of vertical integration, starting at the top with the EX uh, saxophones, which is what I myself personally play. Um, to get the model numbers out of the way uh, to start with, the Alto version is the YAS875EX Mark II, and the tenor is the YTS875EX. So big picture about the EX is it's all designed with the concept of stress-free playability. If you're a saxophonist yourself, or if you've even listened to saxophone music, especially the, the more modern repertoire, uh, the music is being, uh, that is being written is increasingly and increasingly more difficult, especially uh, on your hands, the ergonomics and the, the challenges that those pieces present. So we wanted to design an, an instrument that you can focus on the music, right? You're not thinking about the horn. Will it perform? Will I be able to do certain things? Um, so you can literally focus on the music and not worry about if your tool will do what it's supposed to. Uh, part of that stress-free playability too, and what makes the 875 really what it is, is the bore design. And that's what uh, some of those numbers represent there. So the bore is, is uh, designed to be optimally, uh, optimized tonal control, excuse me. Um, and basically what that means, uh, if, if we're to get down to what the actual shape of it is, it is closer to being cylindrical. So it flares less as it gets to the bottom. And what that does is it makes it very easy to create a controlled, uh, solid core to your sound. So you don't have to put a whole lot of effort into this instrument to create a warm, beautiful, and luxurious sound. So let's get into some more of the specifics about the instrument and some of the uh, things that we've changed over the years. Uh, so let me move my little window here. So yeah, first off, ergonomics. We talked, uh, we just mentioned, you know, stress-free playability. Um, when we are looking at this instrument and designing it, you know, we already had a, a good uh, foundation of what saxophone ergonomics should be. But, you know, as, as Chris mentioned earlier, we're always pushing to make it better. How can this be improved? What are players, what do players need to make it easier for them? So literally every single piece on the instrument where your fingers come in contact with were totally reanalyzed for comfort, again, thinking about that modern repertoire, how it's increasingly more difficult um, considering you know, the professional level players that will be using this instrument. So some of those things that did change uh, is the new shape for the front F key. Um, so the previous model, not that it was uncomfortable, but we found that the shape be more ergonomic and easier to, to switch to, right? Um, the new angle of the thumb hook for your right hand, you know, a lot of saxophone players know if that uh, hook isn't in the right position, you can really cause a lot of damage to your wrist. Um, not only that, but you know, your, your technique is going to suffer from that um, by putting too much strain on those muscles. So changing that angle um, and position of the hook really allows a player to fit the horn a bit more specifically to them. The, the palm keys, so on the, the left hand, the, the top palm keys uh, were repositioned. Uh, a lot of players know that that can be a very difficult part of the horn to maneuver. Um, you know, naturally what we do with our hands every day, that's not a normal thing for our hands to be doing. Um, so putting those in the correct spot really helped a lot of people. And actually during the, the development process of this, you know, everyone's got different size hands. So some of the players that were involved in the testing, some of them were very, you know, smaller humans that had smaller hands and others were much larger humans that had very large hands. So we didn't settle until both of those uh, sized players were happy with the position of those. And then last but not least, a great example of what ergonomic changes happened were the pinky keys. So on the, on the left hand, you think for most, players who are right-handed, their left hand is their non-dominant hand. The pinky is their smallest, weakest finger, and it's responsible for moving the largest uh, keys on the saxophone at the extreme bottom end of the instrument. So it's really set up to be difficult in the first place, just the way the saxophone is designed. 
Um, but by repositioning where these pinky keys are and changing some of the angles of the rollers, we made it as easy as possible uh, to maneuver in that lower register. Um, so very similar to ergonomics, intonation was re completely reanalyzed, right? To tone hole placement and the sizes to really optimize um, everything in, in regards to pitch and intonation. Again, going back to that stress-free playability. Um, you shouldn't have to manipulate a whole lot with your, with your embouchure to be able to play in tune. So some of the, the results of adjustments that we made were, um, yeah, resulted in, in some adjustments, uh, which really come down to a lot of those changes happened in the lower register. So some tone holes were slightly resized there. Um, so the low end, which is a notoriously difficult uh, area of the saxophone to get to respond, um, improved intonation and improved response, right? When you get to both of those extremes, whether it's the high or the low, uh, it gets a lot more difficult to manipulate with your embouchure. So a lot of great changes there. And then uh, last point on this page is the middle range was improved, you know, that middle C or middle B area. Since you've only got, you know, one or two keys down uh, at most, you, your horn is physically a shorter distance at that time so you have less instrument to, to work with. So it's actually also difficult to adjust for pitch a whole lot in that middle register. Um, so some uh, adjustments there also made it uh, much easier and comfortable and natural to play without having to overcompensate um, in any of those pieces. So some of my, uh, one of my favorite things about the EX is actually the necks that they come with. Um, and the EX is unique because the alto and tenor versions actually come with different necks. Um, and a lot of times I get that question, you know, why does alto come with the V1 and why does the tenor come with the E1? Uh, well, I can say from personal experience even, I'm mostly a tenor player and I've got my EX tenor right here with me. Uh, I love the E1 neck. Um, I've tried the, the V1 on it and I've tried the different C1 on it and they're they're all great you know for for me though it doesn't work and we found for the large majority of players that gravitate towards this style instrument looking for this type of sound the e1 will fit you know 95 percent of players and for those five percent that maybe the horn's really close but it's not quite right switching that neck will usually uh seal the deal for them so the v1 and e1 necks are great uh just so you all know, the V is our largest size, the E is our medium size, and the C, which isn't listed here, uh, sold separately, is our smallest size. Um, definitely a, a meaty topic we could get into, uh, perhaps in the Q&A if we have some time. Uh, so the case here, uh, what's pictured is the Alto case, and it's a really nice contemporary case. So you've got that leather-like finish, You've got a big outer pocket to fit all your music and extra accessories that you might need. Uh, it also does have those backpack straps that can be tucked away if not needed. And it's got a handle on both the side and the top of the case, which might seem like such a really small detail, but I can't tell you how many times I've, you know, because of a tight space or something like that, carrying it from those two different handle options really came in handy. Um, you can't quite see it behind me because of the lighting, but I do have the tenor case uh, with me. It is more of the traditional briefcase style hard shell case. Um, if, if anyone has a particular question about that, I can bring it into the light later. Um, and then last but not least for this slide is the mouthpiece, which I think a lot of players, um, you know, kind of look over the mouthpiece that comes with an instrument. Uh, what's really cool about Yamaha, you know, not only do we have a specific team dedicated to designing saxophones, it's not, you know, they're not a woodwind designers, they are saxophone designers. We also have a team dedicated to mouthpiece design, right? So the, in, the mouthpieces that come with the horns are actually really solid mouthpieces. Maybe they're not what you play on every day. Maybe it's not what you perform on. But if you, if you buy a Yamaha instrument, give the mouthpiece a try. Um, you know, it's a solid piece. Worst case scenario, it makes a great backup um, in that situation. Um, for me, as a, as a classical player, mostly, I have my classical mouthpiece, but sometimes if I need to do a little bit of jazz, the 4C actually kind of helps me out sometimes. It's, it's a little more open, it's a little more 
uh, punchy versus my normal piece. Uh, so yeah, always give it a try. Don't just dismiss it. We, you know, our designers would greatly thank you for doing so. Um, so yeah, kind of to wrap up the EX, uh, remember the big thing about this model is the stress-free playability component to it. You know, where music is getting harder, the demand for, for perfection is getting a, a lot more intense. Um, so, so you need an instrument that can help you succeed in those ways. The EX is, is definitely geared at a warm centered focused sound. So if you're looking for something that maybe is super punchy and really spread, maybe this, this isn't the horn for you. Um, uh, going back to on the other side with the stress free playability, the ergonomics are very modern. So perhaps if you're used to a vintage horn or you know, just a different key layout, maybe it'll take some time getting used to it under, under the fingers, right? Because it is a very different, uh, if you compare it to some other brands or models, something to keep in mind. Um, but the reason, one of the reasons uh, that we're, we're so glad to have this model is, is the artists that we had involved in the development of it. And pictured here are two of those very key artists, uh, Otis Murphy and Nabuya Sagawa. Uh, if you are a saxophonist and are not familiar with these names, you should feel slightly ashamed. Uh, definitely go check them out. They are, you know, arguably the best sax classical saxophonists in the world right now. Um, even if you're not a classical player, you should be familiar with these artists. Um, just, you know, aside from their involvement with Yamaha, just the extraordinary musicianship and playing abilities that they have. Uh, so I believe that wraps up the EX. Uh, Austin, a, a, a quick question, Austin, on the, the concept of stress-free playability. So we had a question from the audience. Um, it makes sense on a premium model that that would be the case, but uh, also you'd think that a student model for beginning students would also want to be, you know, have very stress-free free playability. What, what additional then can you do with these premium models to make them even more uh, stress-free than what you might see on a student model? Sure. So I think to best answer that, you have to remember, um, you know, student models are designed in a way that make it easy for a student to produce a good sound. Maybe it's not an extra, extra sparkly, fancy sound. It's a very basic, straightforward, but solid saxophone sound. As you, as you progress, um, the the features and design changes that happen are done knowing that the player has more experience, they have more ability um, to be, you know, add those extra musical elements. Um, and so, you know, if, one example I like to say is if you, if you gave an EX to a, a total beginner, you know, that's like giving a 16 year old a Ferrari. Sure, they can drive it, but you know, it's, it's a bit more than they can handle. Um, and at the same time, you know, a 16-year-old in a Ferrari, sure, it's a cool car, but they won't quite, you know, they don't know the nuances quite yet to understand the benefits of all those little touch pieces, right? When, when you are more experienced, either, you know, high school, college, or, or above, um, those, little, those little changes here and there make a much bigger difference in your playing. Um, I, I, hope that, I hope that answered the question. Um, yeah, but yeah so, absolutely. The, the car is a great comparison to uh, the, the beginning model versus the more advanced model. They still drive, they still have a steering wheel, four mm -hmm. wheels, but there's a lot of nuance between a high end car and a lower end car. So right. And so if, if you're if you're new to music and you know looking for an instrument for yourself or perhaps you're a parent looking for your child. I um, mean, you know, I, I think that's one of those uh, comparisons that really bring this home. You know, in, in my personal experience, I was the first person in the family to join music. My parents had no idea, you know, what model's better, which one should I get? Um, and, and that's one of those points that really helps bring home the importance of having a quality instrument and knowing when to step up. So speaking of step up, going on down the line of our vertical integration, next up is the 62 model. Uh, the models, both of these alto and tenor, are the 62 Mark III. Now, if, if you are already a saxophonist, 
uh, there's a very good chance you've already heard of the 62. Oh, and it looks like we have a poll that popped up. Please take a moment to answer that and we'll keep going along. Um, so yeah, it, the 62 is a very legendary model and there's uh, a very important reason for that that we'll get into in a moment. Um, but one of the reasons it's become such a legendary model is because it's quite literally like a Swiss knife, a Swiss army knife of saxophones. It can do anything. We have um, professional musicians making a living off of this instrument playing classical music. We have jazz musicians, smooth jazz, rock, every genre in between. You would be really amazed at the versatility a player can get out of this instrument without changing anything about it. They're not taking it to a tech to get it tweaked. They're not changing out the neck. Sure, they have their own mouthpiece, but it is an incredibly flexible and versatile instrument. But the person we have to thank for the 62 and its legacy is Eugene Rousseau, who, uh, again, if you're not familiar with Eugene Rousseau as a saxophonist, make a note, Google him, uh, even search on YouTube. There's some interviews we do with him as well. Uh, but if we go to the next slide now, we'll see a bit of a timeline about the 62 development um, and Dr. Eugene Rousseau's involvement. So to start this off, um, when we started working with uh, Dr. Rousseau in 1973, uh, Dr. Rousseau had three main principles that he needed to, excuse me, that he needed to make sure were accomplished in order to create excuse me, develop a, a good instrument. The first one is acoustics. And that comes down to tone hole placement, the body taper, the intonation, you know, all those sound related aspects needed to be solid. The second was the mechanics. So under the hands that actually had to feel good and comfortable, right? And the third is, is kind of, is a bit more of an abstract one. And that was artistic feeling. Um, and that goes beyond just is it a good instrument, right? This is more so as an artist, can you create the music that you want to create through the instrument? So it's that deeper level. Um, so yeah, we started work in 1973 and the first 62 model was not released until 1979. So it took, uh, quick math, there we go, six years, six, seven years uh, to develop a saxophone. That's how long it took. And that's a great example of vertical integration. At the time, this was our highest level saxophone. So we spent a ton of effort, a lot of energy with our research and development to make sure this set us up correctly so that the other models below it could experience that same um, benefit from that research and development. The second model of 62 came out in 2003, which was actually the same time the first custom EX models came out. Um, so, you know, between those two dates, uh, there was a lot of lessons learned as far as our research and development goes. Um, a lot of lessons about a, a, acoustics, a lot of manufacturing improvements. Um, and so during that time, the EX was being developed and even some lessons learned from that model got pulled down into the new 62 model. Uh, and then finally, uh, what is today the current model, in 2013, the third generation 62 came out. Um, so three generations is, is, you know, if you look at some of our other models, is a lot of generations for an instrument without, you know, just changing the model number. Um, but this goes back to Yamaha's continuous effort to always improve an instrument, always how can we make this better. Great, it's the best we can right now but you sh we should never settle, you know, especially as innovation and technological advances improve. There's no reason we shouldn't be continuing to push. So with the 62, um, some of the other features about it is the neck it comes with. It's actually its own dedicated 62 style neck. Um, if, if we had to compare it to some of the custom sizes, uh, it is somewhere in between the medium and small, uh, which is the E and the C neck. But what that does, it, it, it's a very fast responding instrument. It's almost completely effortless to get your sound started. Um, and as I mentioned, a moderately sized uh, bore neck. The case it comes with, what's pictured is the alto case, but both alto and tenor case are the same style. Uh, it also has that large outside uh, 
pocket to store all your music and extra accessories. And it does have those backpack straps that can be tucked away if needed. So just a different material, but overall kind of the same shape and size as the, uh, as the EX that we previously talked about. So to wrap up the 62 model, again, it is a legendary model, um, partly because of the work that Eugene Rousseau has put into and you know, continued to put into for a very long time. And the other reasons it's become a legendary model is because of its acceptance by players of varying styles, right? Uh, Eugene Rousseau is very much a classical player, yet we have artists like Dave Cause making a living playing smooth jazz on that exact model, um, which is really quite amazing when you think about the, the span that it can cover. Uh, the annealing process is actually something we didn't mention before, um, but I can take a minute now. Um, so this is actually, it, it, to, to, to simplify, it's basically a, a, treat, a heat treatment that takes place on the metal. And at a molecular level, the molecules are changing inside that metal. Um, and with any wind instrument, whether it's a saxophone or a clarinet or a tuba, different materials resonate differently. And we found the annealing process at the professional and custom level were, was a very big benefit to professional players. Again, this goes to the, it's one of those nuanced things that perhaps younger, less experienced players can't fully appreciate. But once you step up to this pro and custom level, it, it makes a substantial difference. So uh, this is an example of something that's been vertically integrated from the custom level. And then as we just mentioned to the professional 62 styled neck. Um, it is definitely a upgrade from, from models below it. Um, and it continues the progression as the player gets more experience and is looking for more musical expression in there. Austin, a question about the finishes. So in our poll, the responses actually were surprisingly even across three or four different finishes. So I, I okay. think it I think it shows that there's a lot of variety in saxophone uh, preference, but how would you describe the different finishes and the relative tone? So we saw pictures of the black lacquer, we've got the silver plated, regular lacquer. I know you offer unlacquered instruments. Can you kind of compare and contrast some of those for us? Sure, so it, it's, it's kind of, it, it is an interesting topic because for everyone who has an opinion, there is also an, a counter opinion on it. <laughs> Uh, my take on finishes, and I think a lot of people would agree, is the finish really makes a difference to the player and how it responds, you know, inside your own head and, and the way you are, you are hearing your sound. To an audience that's maybe, you know, 100 feet away, you'd have to have some really good ears to hear a huge difference. It'll be very subtle, so it is there, but, but as a player myself, I believe it's more of an internal feeling of how the horn responds. So generally speaking, if we take the lacquer finish as the standard, um, generally speaking, the silver is actually going to be a little bit brighter. And that's because of one, it doesn't have a layer of lacquer on top of it, which is why oftentimes you'll hear uh, silver instruments can tarnish. So they do require a little bit more upkeep if you want to keep them shiny. Um, but so they don't have the lacquer. So it's, a, it's less material on the instrument and the silver plating you know, resonates at that different frequency. And then the black lacquer is, what makes it black is actually there is a very small amount of dye that's put into the lacquer mix. Um, and so we're quite literally adding just the tiniest amount of material um, to the overall finish. And in turn, most people, uh, uh, most people identify the, the black lacquer finish as actually producing a slightly darker sound because it's a, a thicker uh, lacquer layer on it. When it comes to the unlacquered, uh, you won't see that option in the EX, uh, but for uh, the Custom Z, which we haven't quite uh, covered yet, um, the Custom Z, there is an unlacquered option. And so you can imagine if normal lacquered is considered the standard, take that lacquer off and it's going to vibrate and resonate very freely to the point where for some players, it might be too much, right? Um, some players like a little bit of resistance, something to push up against. But for those with a very big sound or very, looking for something that's very projecting, um, unlacquered might be that, that route to go. Yeah, great question though. 
Okay, and then to, to round off the three planned models that we're talking about, uh, it will take a moment to talk about the intermediate level, the YAS or YTS 480, which if you're looking, if you still have a student horn and you're looking to step up, this might be the next logical step um, in your, your uh, uh, arsenal of saxophones to get. Uh, so it, it does have a lacquered keywork. So this is the first model. In if you start from the bottom going up, this is the first model you'll see uh, entirely lacquered keywork. So the ones below it have a nickel silver uh, finish to it. So you right away you get a more professional appearance from a distance. This is also the first model going up that you'll see the high F sharp key um, added to the spec sheet. And this is a really important key. It might not seem like much because it's one key is added and you're, you're adding one note on top of your range. But as the player progresses and starting to play more advanced music, they're starting to play more scales and extended scales, that one key is going to make a very big difference. Um, I can tell you from personal experience, if I didn't have an F sharp key, uh, I, it would have been a big, big struggle, right? So it makes a world of difference there. The, the neck on the 480, uh, it is not the exact same neck as the current 62, but it is modeled after the 62 neck. Um, the 480 neck is actually uh, closely resembles the neck from the first generation 62. So that one uh, that Eugene Rousseau first developed with Yamaha. Um, so it is, again, it is a progression in uh, a, a musician's uh, career as they develop more experience. This neck allows them to start adding more musicality to it um, because they have more control over their embouchure and, and the sounds that they make. Uh, one really cool thing about the 480, and this also is from the 480 upwards now, um, let's say you do step up to a 480. It's, it's that time and you, and you decide to get it and you have a 480, awesome. A year or two goes by and you still love the horn, but now you want to somehow upgrade your sound uh, a bit more. And maybe a new horn isn't quite, you know, in, in the, it's not quite time for a whole new horn, but the 480 does fit custom level necks. So you can upgrade your sound without having to buy an entirely new instrument if it's just not in the cards for you at that time. Austin, that's a, a great uh, kind of great way to look at the, the top down, the, the EX, the 62, the 480, that vertical integration uh, really kind of comes home when you get to that interchangeable neck piece. Uh, I have a, a couple, a couple follow-up questions. Uh, so the, the question about when it's time to step up, maybe Chris, I'll ask this to you. You've worked with a lot of students uh, over the years. What, how does a parent or a student know when is the right time for them to start maybe looking at a better instrument, whether it's the 480 or the 62? Sure, you know, um, when the right time is, it really depends on, on the player. You know, when they start to kind of mature and build the muscles that the student instrument is designed as Austin mentioned, just to get a good sound, you know, to get them started off on the right foot. As they mature and they grow, they're going to kind of grow out of that horn, so to speak. So typically, if I had a pagan age, we're seeing it in, you know, after year two is probably the first time that we really see the kind of mass of people start to step up into either the next level um, if they wait a little longer and they're into high school, say they start in sixth grade and they wait till they're in high school, then um, they may kind of even leapfrog that kind of intermediate series and go on into a 62 um, at that point. Because again, very versatile, uh, a little higher end and something that you can continue to play even if you're going to attend college or just play for fun for the rest of your life. Austin, I'm also really curious in this step up process for you as a saxophonist, how do you go about trying a new instrument? Obviously, you have to get a sense of it, but should you be playing difficult music? Should you play be playing easy music? Should you be bringing your teacher to listen to it? Should you be taking the advice of a, you know, another player? What's the process for testing a new instrument? Great question, Kurt. Um, you know, I, for, for a short while, I had my own private lesson students, um, and they were right at that age, the two-year mark, where all, a lot of them were looking to step up. Um, and so right away, 
if at all possible, bring your teacher in, you know, because that's someone who knows you as a player um, and they know, you know, where you need to go instrument wise or what you might need to avoid even. Um, and it also, it, you know, if they are your teacher, you know, you ultimately have to play for your teacher. Um, another thing too is with, when you're trying out new saxophones, it is a lot of fun, but this isn't the time to show off and play something flashy, right? Um, this isn't the time to see how fast you can play your scales or how high of a note you can play. This is really where you're testing the instrument. You're not practicing, right? So you should play something slow, um, something you're familiar with like scales right where we should all be familiar with our scales um, and that's a great way to test from the bottom of the instrument to the top of the instrument with something you are familiar with same thing uh, again we're testing the instrument we're not testing the mouthpiece we're not testing the reed so make sure that you have a reed and mouthpiece set up that you are familiar with already um, that you know is good when you're playing on your existing horn, you know, this is a good read, this is a good mouthpiece, this is what I'm comfortable with. The, the next thing, which is, can be a challenge for some players, when you pick up an instrument, do your absolute best to not compensate for the natural tendencies that you're used to on your instrument. Say, you know, some notes are really sharp and some notes are really flat and, you know, it, it becomes second nature that you just make those compensations without even thinking about it. So I really challenge my students and anyone trying out new instruments to avoid doing that as much as possible. Let the horn play like the horn is supposed to. Um, and then keep in mind, you know, there's some things as a player, regardless of what your skill level is, with a new instrument, there's gonna be a slight uh, adjustment period, right? So there's things, you know, uh, how the hands exactly feel. Yeah, they're gonna feel a little different, but that's something you can overcome. Um, but how easy an instrument responds or, or the basic tone characteristic that comes out of it, that's not something that is very easy to overcome, right? So those, uh, we're, yeah, again, we're, we're testing the instrument. We're not seeing how well we can play. Uh, last bit that I would add to that too is, and this is, this is more so the case with experienced players. If you give, you know, if you give uh, a Jeff Coffin any instrument, you get a, a beat up student horn, he's going to eventually sound like himself. So when you're trying out horns, uh, it, in my opinion is the first impression, the first sound you make says a lot. So that first sound you make is going to be, you don't know what to start, you don't know what's gonna happen, right? So you have no, um, you're not compensating right away. It's, it's true sound, it's true horn. So. I would encourage when you're trying out new horns, pick up, you know, test out your reed, make sure your home base is set with your own instrument. And then pick up that new one, start in the middle range and play a scale and then put it down. Maybe spend 10 seconds on it. Uh, if you spend too much time, your subconscious is gonna kick in and start doing those small adjustments that you might not even realize you're doing. Um, so I, again, yeah, the biggest thing I would go back to is first impressions really matter on, on a new instrument when you're trying yeah. it out. Yeah. And real quick, can I add something to that, Kurt? So just, I would also say that I'm not everybody's lucky enough to take their teacher uh, to the store with them to buy an instrument. So don't hesitate to rely on the, uh, the salesperson at the store. I mean, they're, they're there, they're an expert, they have a set of ears, they're more than happy to help. And uh, they can certainly kind of step in in that situation and, and be that person for you. Yeah, my, my comment was the salesperson can oftentimes be an unbiased set of ears too. Mm -hmm. So they have no preconceived notion. And uh, in fact, many of the, the sales staff at the music and art stores are actually highly trained musicians, uh, many with music degrees. And so very, uh, you know, very appropriate to, uh, to gain some of their response. Uh, Austin, last, last question. Uh, you mentioned earlier about the, the one model we didn't talk about. So we have the, the EX custom model, the 62, the 480. Those are all among the most popular saxophones on the planet. There's one more that we didn't really cover, uh, the 82Z, uh, which is a really unique horn. Just give us the, the, the two-minute overview on that horn as well. Sure, yeah. So one question I get a lot, because they are both custom level saxophones, if you were to look at the Yamaha family tree, they're on the same level of, of 
of that tree. Um, so a lot of a lot of times people ask, well, which one's better? Uh, not, one is not better than the other. They are simply different flavors. You know, both chocolate and vanilla ice cream are great, but sometimes I want chocolate and not vanilla, right? Um, and so with the, with the EX we mentioned, the 875 bore was more cylindrical, right? It flared less. And the result of that is that super focused centered sound. The Z, the 82Z actually flares more. So it's closer to a conical bore. So at the bottom, it is actually flares more at the bottom. And the result of that is you get a generally a brighter, more punchy, uh, fat sound. Um, you know, we, we try to not pigeonhole, you know, one's classical, one's jazz, because we do have artists, and I even have some, uh, some very close friends of mine who play what you would think was the opposite intended for that horn. Um, so don't let, you know, oh, this one's supposed to be bright and this one's supposed to be dark, because that's not always the case. Don't let um, that, you know, don't pigeonhole yourself into that. Give them both a try if the opportunity is there. Um, but yeah, so the Z, the Z actually, with the development story, the Z came um, to be its name uh, because it was described to have a sizzle about it. And so that's how the 82 got that Z uh, nomenclature there. So it is a very, a very flexible, um, very free and punching instrument. And for those same reasons, that's why we offer the unlacquered finish uh, in that model. For players looking for that sort of sound, that unlacquered can open it up even more so for those players at the extreme end of, of that spectrum. What, a, what an incredible family of instruments. Uh, I'd like to, to thank Austin and Chris uh, for joining this product showcase about Yamaha saxophones. I think everyone will agree that these are some absolutely amazing instruments and it's no surprise that these are among the top choices for players, teachers, students, professionals worldwide. Uh, very, very impressive. During this Upgrade Your Sound showcase, we've got a couple of uh, unique offers available, including 48 month financing. Uh, for the very first time we've been able to offer 48 month financing, you can get this special financing at your local music and arts store. Uh, or online uh, through Wilbur and Brasswin. Uh, you can learn more details uh, with a follow-up email that you'll receive, as well as you can uh, learn more by going directly to wilburnandbrasswin.com. Uh, uh, you can choose financing. We also have a special offer of 15% off uh, purchases over $199. Uh, that'll run through the end of the month, uh, so you can learn more details online at Wilbur and Brasswin or at your local music and arts store. Uh, if you do have more questions, this showcase extends in store through the weekend where you can visit your local store to speak with an instrument expert, try some of these great instruments and learn more about lessons and repairs uh, that music and arts offers. Thanks again for joining this showcase about Yamaha saxophones and Chris and Austin. Thank you so much for your participation today. Thanks everyone, appreciate it. Thanks Kurt, thanks everyone.